We've heard a lot about research already today, so why do we need another talk about it? Well, I think most of what we've heard about so far today is about patients as consumers of research. A sort of somewhat passive role of here's what's on offer, do you want to take part? And, and what I want to talk about is how we change that. Uh, and this comes back to something that, that Imogen touched on in the last session about digitization of clinical trials. And if anybody came to the melanoma focus meeting last month, they may get a sense of deja vu uh, about this, because I, I talked a bit about this uh, three or four weeks ago at, at that virtual meeting. So what, what do I mean by this, and, and what is my melanoma? Melanoma has changed quite a bit since I started looking after people with the condition in the mid-1990s. And with those changes for the better come significant changes in the pattern of care. So when I started out, melanoma was, was done by a few people who were intrinsically interested in the disease and the problem that it posed. Uh, and then otherwise it was done by whichever medical oncologist had most recently been appointed uh, at a particular center because it was all a bit depressing. And now, obviously, with effective treatments, people living much longer and so forth, the nature of the questions that we're called upon to answer has changed significantly. And because melanoma care is in, 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 controlled by medical oncologists, we're perhaps not really very good at asking the questions that now matter. They're questions about how you survive melanoma and how you live with melanoma. And we're, we're, we've been very focused upon how you bump up the numbers of people who live with melanoma, but perhaps less focused on what that means. So those questions are changing. It also means that there's quite a lot of you now, and we're struggling to look after you all through medical oncology services that are really set up to deliver drugs to people uh, and not necessarily to, to look after them over the long term, although we're changing that by bringing in specialists to, to, to focus on that aspect of care. Uh, but it also means that with, where, where we have these specialist centres, like places like Oxford, is that we're asking a small subset of patients with melanoma who attend a small subset of treatment centres to engage in research, and either asking you to come to those centres or asking the people who already come to those centres to participate in a lot of research and perhaps we could spread that out uh, you know, more widely amongst the community. Uh, and we have this issue that you, know, you, you get to take part in the research that your clinician or clinicians choose to run at the hospital you attend. And you know, I, I think when we're talking about patient-centered care, that's not, not appropriate. Uh, and so one of the questions that Julie Newton-Bishop and I have been working on to try to address with the help of lots of other people over the last 12 months or so is how do we change that uh, and the answer is with, with a lot of time and effort because you know, this is a sort of changing the direction of a super tanker we need to make our, our research more widely available for people to take part in. It, it needs to be more representative as well. I mean, one of the big problems that we have, and we saw this with the BRAF inhibitor drugs when they first came out, is that if you do clinical trials in a narrow subset of people who are younger, fitter, wealthier, uh, than the patients whom you treat day to day, then you run into difficulty translating those results into the real world, uh, where the treatment is rather less tolerable, uh, particularly at the beginning when you're still working out how best to look after people's side effects and so forth. Uh, and then the other thing we want to do is, is to get you to drive some of the research, uh, you to set the research priorities, uh, and not have us dictate what those are based upon who takes us to nice conferences or buys us the best 10p pen or whatever it is, inducement that, that we're allowed to accept within the NHS. None at all, by the way. Um, and the other thing we need to do is, is to work at a very different scale from the one that we're used to. Uh, and this is really the development of a revolution that's happened over the last 20 years. So I, I first worked on a drug called timozolomide, 
back in the late 1990s. We published a clinical trial in melanoma with that drug uh, in 2000 when we included 305 people in the phase three study. And that was then the biggest melanoma phase three trial that had been done in metastatic disease. Uh, you'd be laughed out of court today if you tried to do a trial that small as the basis for changing care. And then some of the issues that have been raised today during the course of various conversations require us to, to extend that leap where we've gone from 300 to nearer 3,000 for our trials and think about what questions require 30,000 people to answer. And these things like, what should I eat? Is it okay to take antibiotics? Uh, can I exercise, not exercise? X, Y, and Z and affect my chances of recurrence all require a much greater scale than we're used to doing at the moment. And this is uh, a statistical representation of it, which doesn't project very well, uh, much better on the, uh, uh, in, in the virtual event where you could get the whole slide up. But, but what it says really is that if you start to look for subtle interactions that change the risk of a recurrence, for example, by about 10%, then you're going to very rapidly need thousands of people to tell you whether that's real or not, or whether it's just a, a quirk of, of the data set that you've gathered. Now, a lot of the research that we've tried to do over the last couple of years has been heavily impacted by COVID. Our, our own unit in Oxford closed down overnight, about three hours notice. Uh, to make way for uh, uh, an inpatient ward for heavily immunosuppressed patients. We kept things running by borrowing store cupboards and outpatient rooms and so forth throughout the pandemic. And then we've slowly got our research back up, uh, partly because our staff have been working on COVID studies, part partly because the administration around research has, has become heavily gummed up. And it, that's slowly unwinding and things are, are improving. But there's also a fantastic opportunity from what happened with the COVID studies in particular. And we've been very fortunate in Oxford to have a, uh, a close-up view uh, of some of these things that are sufficiently famous to mean that I may be royalty in the melanoma world, but I'm about the only professor left in Oxford who hasn't been knighted or made a dame um, <laughs> because of their work on COVID. Um, and you know, we, we've had the opportunity to see how the recovery trial, which guided a lot of the treatments for COVID, was set up very quickly, uh, and how we might be able to take advantage of some of the learnings there about how to set up research in an environment where you don't want people to come to hospital because it might not be very good for them to do that. Uh, and you know, leaving aside the issues of you know, coming to hospital gives you the opportunity for direct interaction. There's a lot of stuff around research that can easily be done closer to home uh, in a distributed model. Uh, and we're very fortunate in the UK to have access to fantastic centrally held data, which means that we could do a lot of the heavy lifting required around some of the, the particularly lifestyle questions in research without going to the oncology professionals, the nurses, the physios, the pharmacists, and bothering them, because actually we can find out what they're up to by looking at these massive data sets held um, on the cloud. Uh, and we also now have mechanisms for getting into them without breaking confidences and by keeping the data secure and so forth. So there's a great opportunity to, to learn more from what's already going on and to do different types of research that could still be hugely valuable. So Julia Newton Bishop and I you know, started to play around with this idea and Julia has been a big driver for this uh, and I was hoping she might be able to be here today but she has now rather a lot of grandchildren and I understand that one of them is commanding her attention at the moment. Um, so, but what we're in the late stages of setting up, and I had hoped that maybe I'd have a version to share with you today, but I don't yet, is, is a website called My Melanoma, which is designed to uh, bring research to the patient in the same way that we, we know and love from various social media sites and so forth, where we generate our own content, um, but also we can then 
give permission to link in to existing central NHS databases and transfer them to what's technically called a trusted research environment where people's identity is masked and crunch the data to uh, make sense of it and to draw conclusions that can then inform other types of study. So the idea behind this is that there'll be a, a, a front door, a, a website, where people can sign up to take part uh, and choose the extent to which they take part. They might just want to register and say, here I am, you can go look at my data, or just here I am, I haven't decided whether you can see my data yet, or you can participate more actively. You could look at some questionnaires that are applicable to your particular situation. Julia's interest, as many of you all know, is in familial melanoma, and that's one of the places where we're going to start with questionnaires that have been developed over the years around that, around lifestyle. Uh, and then we also want to hear about some of the things that we've not asked about properly over the years. Quality of life, which is often tacked on to, to trials of, of new drugs, although I think we all know and understand that the instruments that we currently use to assess quality of life were designed for chemotherapy, not for immunotherapy, not for targeted therapy, and therefore we're often asking the wrong question. And the other thing we want to understand, which is rather different from quality of life, is what the burden of treatment is. Now, it's a real pain being on treatment for melanoma, uh, and the quality of life instruments don't really capture that. You know, the, the, the enduring crappiness of trying to park at a hospital. Um, and, and things which people might say are trivia, but you know, if you're coming back every week, you know, they mount up, they become significant burdens. So the idea is, is to have a forum in which we can start to gather that information systematically around well-developed questions. So this isn't just a fishing expedition, but we're, we're trying to ask and answer a particular question. And the way in which we're going to do this is later this year, now that we've got ethical approval for this approach, is that we're going to launch the website with a focus upon families with melanoma uh, and use them as the guinea pigs to find out where we've gone wrong in designing the website. We, we have got some professional web designers in. This is not me and Julia putting a website together because that would be a car crash. Um, and then what we'll be doing is on the basis of that testing and iteration is to roll it out to any melanoma patient and to launch the questionnaire-based studies uh, that, um, that we want to, to get going. Uh, as the low-hanging fruit, we don't need to send samples around the country and things like that uh, for the questionnaire-based stuff, and to link that in with the uh, NHS data sets. And you know, we're very grateful to the support we've had from a small grant from Melanoma Focus, uh, to help get that off the ground, uh, and for Julia ruining her retirement, such as it is, um, in, in doing a lot of that work. Uh, but phase three, and the more ambitious part, which will probably be next year or the year after, will be to then start to collect samples, to answer questions about the microbiome, to answer questions about things like the ctDNA, that Becky talked about earlier today, uh, and to, to ask some more sophisticated questions. In an ideal world, we'd quite like to then tack on the drug side of things as well, but you know, that's very heavily regulated and pulls us back to hospitals uh, and, and back to um, uh, you know, going to specific places to access that type of research. And I think for very sound reasons, so I think that, that that's a model that we'll need to think about harder if we want to, to move on to that phase of things. Uh, but the, the, the challenge is to set this up, get this up and running, get hundreds of people involved, preferably thousands, uh, because I think that there's a virtuous cycle of participation leading, greatly improving our ability to raise funds to deliver it, and greatly extending uh, the sorts of questions that we can answer from it. We very deliberately set this up as an academic endeavor. We could probably go and pick the pockets of pharma to get this funded, if not completely, then extensively from that. 
but I think that raises a number of ethical issues, and it also raises some significant flags in terms of how we then access centrally held NHS data. Um, you know, the, the Office for Life Sciences is very keen that we use NHS data for research purposes, but rather less keen, I think, for very good reasons, that that then becomes data that's owned by one particular farmer or another. So we want to hold this as a public good. We're very happy to engage with industry, but we want to do that on our terms. And because this is your website, and the questions that we prioritize will be defined by the people who join uh, and by the priorities that they set, this, this will be decided by the research community, not by one individual, two individuals like me. So the key issues that, that we're wrestling with at the moment, and I'm going to stop after this and, and sort of turn it over to you guys to, to talk about so how we raise the money for this, because it's very different from what we normally do. We normally write a grant about a particular trial, about a particular research question. We identify who's kind of interested in that sort of thing and then go and ask them for the money. The other big issue, obviously, is data security. If you've got thousands of people's worth of data flying around, then you need to be pretty sure that it stays where it should. It's only seen by the people who should be able to see it and only seen to the extent to which they need to see it to answer the questions that we've agreed uh, we're going to try and tackle. But there's a pretty mature infrastructure for doing that now, and this is one of the benefits of COVID. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's now a reasonably well-trodden path um, for, for getting hold of this. I wouldn't say it's straightforward. Um, you know, certainly my colleagues dealing with the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine had a rather easier time of it because there, there isn't quite that sense of panic in Whitehall that we must do this, uh, otherwise there'll be trouble. Um, and then the other excitement that we have dealing with data is that... Um, we may be the United Kingdom, but we're the United Kingdom of four different health economies with their own rules uh, and, and regulations about data. So that insofar as we're going to do this right across the UK, we have to have different conversations with Wales, with Northern Ireland, with Scotland than we do with England. Uh, so we'll probably focus on England and Scotland uh, in the first wave partly because that's where we've been able to get some of the money and the support from, and partly because we understand best how to get data out of particularly the English system. Uh, but the, the aim is very much to make this UK-wide. And then the other thing we have to learn is a bit about marketing, because you know, this is uh, about participation on very different terms than we normally do for research. And... So when I, when I talk to people about this, it's about how you build a relationship with the community, keep them engaged and so forth, but not in that sort of slightly patronizing way that as oncologists we like to do, which is here's my trial sign here, uh, and now follow the recipe sheet as set out on my information leaflet. Um, you know, this is less transactional, more fluid, uh, and so I think we have to work a little bit harder as a research community to keep you engaged. Uh, and then we have to give you more say and skin in the game to uh, ensure that there's a good reason to stay engaged with this and that this isn't just you know, one of those websites that you go back in a year's time and it's tumbleweed. So that's where we've got to so far. Um, it's a slightly different approach. It doesn't speak to a lot of the therapies that we've heard about today, but I think it's very germane to these issues of risk and how we handle risk, how we negotiate risk day to day, away from treatment. And I think it's particularly well suited to the development of biomarkers and working out as quickly as possible what tests might be useful in helping guide decision making. You know, Becky talked about the definition of a biomarker, and there are thousands of biomarkers out there that are perfectly valid, tell us something moderately important about risk, but 
there are very, very few that are good enough to say, if I show you this test result, you will agree with me that it's a sound basis for foregoing a treatment that you might otherwise have. The only one we've got for that at the moment really is BRAF. Because I can say to you hand on heart, if you don't have that mutation in your tumor, there is no chance of you benefiting from this particular drug. And you know, most biomarkers shade risk by 10 or 20 percent, maybe 50 percent on a good day. And what we're looking for is biomarkers that say this confers 10 times the benefit or 10 times the risk, because then I think that's the point at which our research to date tells us we start to have a conversation about whether a particular approach is a good idea.